All right, welcome back to CodeDrill. As you remember in the last video, we pointed out an issue with the way that we store passwords in our database. Right now we're storing passwords in clear text and that's obviously a huge problem, especially if our database gets compromised, for example, via an SQL injection or via leftover backup that got disposed of. So we're gonna address that in this video. And to do that, I'd like us to look at some of the theory related to passwords. But even before that, I'd like us to also brush over some of the cryptography basics. I'm not gonna go into too much theory but I just like to touch on some of the key concepts that are going to help us to understand the way that passwords work. Anyway so when it comes to cryptography there is two main concepts we need to talk about. One is hashing and the second one is encryption. So hashing is a one-way transformation from plain text to a digest. Usually hash functions are really fast and they're also deterministic. That is to say that for any given input the function is always going to produce the same exact result. Now a digest is basically a random looking string that you get as the output of running your plain text through this function. Now, as far as the hash functions, there are two main kinds. There's one that is keyless. In this case, you only supply a message to a function. You don't supply any secret keys. So these are some of the ones that you might have heard of, like MD5, SHA1, SHA256, SHA512. And these ones are very popular for things like checksums. So you might have seen this if you're using NPM packages, for example. And the other kind is also keyed hash functions. So these ones take in a message as well as a secret key. So one example would be HMAC SHA256. Now the difference between HMAC and a plain SHA256 is that HMAC will take in a secret key and it's going to produce a vastly different output from SHA256 because the secret key is involved in the process of hashing. Now moving on to encryption, essentially it's a two-way transformation from plain text to ciphertext. So when it comes to hashing, when you produce a hash from a plain text, in theory you're not able to go back from that hash back to plain text. With encryption, it's different. So you can encrypt a string from plain text to a cipher text, but you're also able to, using the same secret key or a pair of secret keys, you're able to go back from cipher text to plain text and restore the original string. So you're going to see that there are two kinds of encryptions. One is symmetric, and this is when you use one single key. So one example would be AES, and there's also asymmetric encryption, in which case you have a pair of public and private keys. And one example would be RSA. Now, one concept that sometimes gets mixed up with cryptography is encoding. Encoding is essentially a reversible transformation without using any secret keys. So some of the examples would be Base64, Base64 URL, hacks. These are all reversible transformation, meaning that you can encode a string, but it can easily go back to the original without using any secret keys. There's also a concept of compression, and this is simply encoding that is done for the purpose of reducing the original size of the input. So some of the examples would be gzip and broccoli. So once again, encoding functions are vastly different from crypto cryptographic functions. Encoding functions are used for transport and cryptographic functions are used for security purposes. Now let's touch a bit on the formats of encoding. So Base64 is a type of encoding that will encode every three bytes into four characters. So it's going to use alphabetic characters from capital A to capital Z, from lowercase a to lowercase z, also all the 10 digits from 0 to 9, as well as plus, forward slash, and equal sign. So the formula to calculate the output in terms of bytes from a given string is to take in the size of the input string, divide it by 3, take a ceiling of that, and multiply by 4. So an example would be, let's say we have a string of 20 bytes. Effectively, in UTF-8 encoding, this would be 20 characters. We're going to take that string, and we're going to divide it by 3. We're going to seal the result, and then multiply it by 4. So we're going to be multiplying 7 by 4. And in the end, we're going to get 24 characters. So that is to say that, let's say we have an input string, once again, of 20 bytes. When you encode it into base64, you're going to get a string that is 24 characters. And once again, there's nothing secret about that output string. String. You can easily base64 decode it and get back the original string with 20 bytes. And the other thing to note is the fact that base64 is also not URL safe. And primarily that's because of the special symbols we use, such as forward slash, equal sign, and plus. And if you want to use a URL safe version of base64, you would need to look into base64 URL. And the last one we're going to look into is hex, also known as base16. So this one is using lowercase characters from A to F and also digits from 0 to 9. So this format of encoding is going to encode one byte of input string into two characters. So the calculation here is really simple. You take in the size of the input string and you multiply by two. So for example, let's say our input string is 20 bytes. We're going to multiply that by two and we're going to get 40 characters in the end. That's going to be the size of the output string. Once again, it's really easy to decode that string. So you take in the output, you decode it with the same hex encoding and you're going to get back the original string without any modifications. All right, and so moving on to passwords, let's first talk about 
the flow of password authentication on a server. So when a user presents a password, typically with an email address or a username to the server, what the server is going to do is it's first going to verify the password. So it's going to run a plain text version of the password through a KDF or what's known as a key derivation function. So a KDF or a hashing function is going to append a unique salt. The salt is going to be simply an auto-generated string that's going to be added at the end of the password. And then the KDF is going to generate a hash of the password plus the salt. So the resulting hash as well as the salt is going to be stored in plain text in a database, typically in a password field. So once again, the thing to note here is that the salt is not secret. So we store the salt in plain text. We hash the password, so we don't store the password in plain text. So we do hash the password plus the salt and we store the hash result, but the salt itself is not secret. So we actually store the salt in plain text. And that's really because we want to use the salt to protect ourselves against pre-computed rainbow tables. So rainbow tables abuse the fact that hash functions such as MD5 or SHA-256, those functions produce the same outputs for the same inputs. So you can build a rainbow table that takes in commonly known passwords and maps them to the resulting hash. So let's say using an algorithm of SHA-1 or SHA-256. If you're able to get read-only access to a database, so if you're able to make a dump of that database, you can use a rainbow table to reverse any passwords that are hashed in it. But that's only given the constraint that the passwords were hashed with a function such as SHA-256 or SHA-512. So to protect against that kind of attack, we're gonna be using a salt. When we add salt to the mix, the rainbow table is going to be useless because the calculation was done not only on the password itself, but password plus the salt. Right, and when the user re-enters the password, the server is going to run that same password through the same hash function. The KDF is going to extract the salt and it's going to regenerate the hash. And when that's done, it's going to perform the comparison of that resulting hash with the original hash that has been stored in the database. Now to touch on a few caveats, when we're given a unique salt, two identical passwords will produce different hashes. Once again, if you just take a function such as SHA-256, if you run that through two identical passwords, you're gonna get the same exact results. If you add two different salts in the mix, you're gonna get two different hashes. That's because if you modify the input string or the input message a little bit, just slightly, it's going to give you a drastically different output from the hash function. And that's what we mean when we say that if you're using a salt with a hash function, you're effectively going to need to build a unique rainbow table for each salt that's being used for each password. And then once the password is hashed, the original password is discarded from the server, so it's effectively garbage collected. And then the resulting hash, of course, theoretically cannot be reversed. So when we store it in the database, what we are expecting is that the resulting hash cannot be converted back to the original string, even if the database was leaked. And it's also for this reason that fast hashes, such as SHA-1, SHA-256, these are not really suitable for passwords, because most of the time passwords will lack entropy, and that's because the passwords are typically very short and length. They're also very weak, so a lot of people would simply use alphabetic characters. You don't add much complexity or much entropy to those passwords. And that's why the passwords are often vulnerable to brute force attacks. And when it comes to SHA and HMAC hashing functions, these hashes are extremely fast to compute using cheap GPU. If you remember, these hashing functions are fast by design. And when we're hashing passwords, speed is the last thing we want. And that's why we use KDFs. KDFs will run a password through many different routes of hashing. And a lot of those KDFs, for example, Bcrypt or Scrypt, have an adaptive work factor. And this allows us to safeguard ourselves against advances in computing in the future. So for example, because the CPU power keeps advancing over time, we can keep bumping up the work factor on the hash function, effectively increasing the number of rounds that that hash function is making and also making it more difficult to reverse using brute force attacks. So generally when thinking about password hashing, we have a number of objectives that we want our hash function to satisfy. So like I said, we really want a slow hash function that takes in many rounds or many iterations and is designed to be inherently resistant to brute forcing attacks. So our hash function needs to be CPU intensive, so it needs to take a lot of CPU cycles, and it also needs to be resilient to GPU acceleration, which has become especially cheap in the last decade. And the function also needs to be RAM intensive. So because CPU power is much easier to parallelize, RAM is a lot more difficult to run in parallel. So for this reason, to avoid brute forcing, once again, we need to make the hash function RAM intensive, effectively limiting the scope of parallelism. As far as the hashing algorithms for passwords in the wild, we have four main ones. So the best one would probably be Argon2. The one followed by it would be Bcrypt. We also have a few less known such as Scrypt and PBKDF2. Now we're gonna be using Bcrypt in this tutorial. I might actually come back and re-implement 
password hashing using Argon2. Effectively, Argon can be used as a drop-in replacement, but it's a good practice to establish a strong password hashing algorithm from the beginning, and this way you won't have to migrate the existing user base to the new algorithm. So for the future projects, I would actually suggest using Argon2, but for this one, we're going to start with Bcrypt for the time being. So there's a few caveats about Bcrypt. So Bcrypt, you have to remember, will truncate the input string on a null byte, and this is assuming that you're using a C-based implementation. So for example, the Bcrypt library in JavaScript uses C native code to run the hashing algorithm. So you have to be careful not to provide a null byte in your input string otherwise it's going to be truncated by that null byte and also the other thing we need to keep in mind is that bcrypt will truncate the input after 72 bytes now these bytes are calculated in utf8 so effectively when you perform validation on your password you need to be mindful of the fact that you can only provide 72 bytes or 72 characters in utf8 as for the password storage so let's first of all talk about the three kinds of attacks that you might encounter we kind of touch on this one but let's go a bit more into detail this one is known as rainbow table attack. So this one effectively is using a lookup table to derive the original password from its hash. So imagine that the database where you store the passwords was leaked and the attacker will look at the hashes stored in the password field and they're going to try to use a rainbow table. So effectively a mapping from various well-known passwords hashed to the original password. So we're going to try to use the hash in your database to get back to the original password. So a dictionary attack is different. So this one is actually trying commonly known passwords from a dictionary. And then the last one is a brute force attack. And this one is simply trying all possible variations to crack the password. And this kind of brings us to the concepts of salt and pepper. So salt, something once again, we touched on already, but salt is a unique string that is being appended to the password before it's being hashed. So again, the salt itself is not secret. So the salt is stored in plain text in the database, but the salt is really only used to thwart rainbow table attacks. Because if we use a unique salt for every password, once again, you're effectively going to have to build a rainbow table for each password or for each salt. And then a pepper is a secret salt. So it's effectively a kind of salt that is stored as a key, a secret key. And it can be either appended to the password or it can also be used as a key to sign the password, for example, using HMAC. And the pepper, of course, is not stored in the database. The pepper, once again, acts as a secret key and it's only going to be stored on the server. And the purpose of using pepper is to slow down brute force attacks. And the last thing we're going to touch on would be approaches to password storage. So what you could do, and this is when let's say you're employing a hashing function of bcrypt, you will bcrypt the incoming password or the passphrase using a salt which in most cases is going to be auto-generated for you. A second approach would be to pre-hash your password. So what we're going to do is before we run bcrypt on the password, we're going to hash the password with a fast hash, for example, shot 56, and we're going to take a base 64 version of that binary string. We're then going to run bcrypt with it using the salt. So the difference is we don't pass in the password directly to bcrypt. We're running it with shot 256 first. We take in the base 64 version of that string and then and we pass it to bcrypt. So this is often done to bypass the maximum length limitation of bcrypt because as you remember bcrypt has a limitation of 72 bytes. Now because SHA-256 always gives us the same output regardless of the size of the input, this effectively allows us to avoid that limitation. So we can effectively take in any length of the password and that password will be hashed to SHA-256 and then we store the base64 version in the database after it's bcrypted. So the one thing to keep in mind is that the digest of these hash functions may in some cases contain null bytes. So once again, this is something to be mindful of because a null byte will indicate the end of a string when you're running it through bcrypt. And so we do not pass raw binary to bcrypt. So what we do is we call base64 on the hash function. So don't forget to run either base64 or hex after you hash the password with SHA-256. And of course, don't simply run SHA-256 and then store the hash in the database. That's not going to suffice. That's not going to be secure. You still need to run that through bcrypt with a salt. And then the next approach would be to pre-hash the password with a secret key. So effectively using a pepper. So we're going to take in the passphrase. We're going to sign it with HMAC SHA-256 using a secret key. We're going to take a base64 version of that binary string and then we're going to pass that string to bcrypt using a unique salt which once again is going to be auto generated in most cases so the difference is once again in this case we use the same hash function except we also use a secret key to sign it using hmac the fourth one that you might encounter is to hash the password and then encrypt it so for example similarly to the first one we run the passphrase through bcrypt 
and auto-generate assault. And then after that, we're going to encrypt it with AES-256 using the secret key and also the initialization vector. And of course, you can combine all the four approaches. So for example, you can pre-hash and then you can also encrypt. So again, we're going to take in the passphrase. We're going to hash it with a SHA-256 without any secrets. We're going to take in the base64 version. We're going to run it through bcrypt with a salt. And finally, we're going to encrypt it with AS-256 using a key and the initialization vector. All right, so these are the different approaches to password hashing and also password storage.